So what I thought I would do is try to speed up the derivation and talk about equilibrium. We have already the concept of thermal equilibrium, mechanical equilibrium, temperature is uniform, no temperature difference if they're in contact, otherwise it would be a heat transfer, and mechanical equilibrium, force balance. Now we'll talk about a composition balance between species and a, and a reaction. To start, go back to perform an energy balance for a closed system neglecting changes in kinetic and potential energy, and there's the first law for a differential change. DU is equal to del Q minus del W. As a little recall, why do we put a D here and a del there? Because one is a property and one is an interaction. All right, so it's a small amount of heat transfer, a small amount of work transfer, but those are not properties, but a small change in a property known as internal energy is D. So we arranged DQ is equal to this. Then we go to the second law, entropy balance. DQ, DS is equal to del Q over T plus del sigma for a closed system. And then you combine these two to eliminate del Q, the amount of small amount of differential heat transfer. And you get this relationship where you have properties and changes in properties on the left-hand side equal to temperature times uh, the strength of the irreversibilities of the entropy generation term. All real processes have some greater than or equal to zero amount of entropy production. So there's an inequality right here we double underline. So TDS minus DU minus PDV must be greater than or equal to zero for all real processes for a closed system neglecting changes in kinetic potential energy. Can the system have a heat transfer? Yes. Can the system have a work transfer? Yes. It would be characterized by boundary work. So chemical and ph uh, phase equilibrium criteria, we think about a fixed temperature and a fixed pressure. So here I have this system, different species in it. At a, don't change the temperature. If you heat it up, it'll change the balance of equilibrium. Maybe it'll shift it here, shift it there. Don't change the pressure, it could shift it. Just think about a fixed temperature and fixed pressure. Introduce the Gibbs function. G is equal to H minus TS, just a definition, property, a new property, the Gibbs function. Expand H U plus P V minus TS for the Gibbs function, and then do a little calculus. A small change in the Gibbs function is related to a small change in U, small change in V, etc. Then rearrange. And notice that what is underlined now on the right-hand side is the same as what's double underlined at the bottom of the first column. Hence, everything on the left-hand side is less than or equal to zero. It's a switch in the orientation of the inequality because of a negative right here. There's a negative. So uh, something that was greater than or equal to zero, but it's negative now, is makes it less than or equal. Okay. So we find that a differential change in the Gibbs function, if pressure doesn't change, and if temperature doesn't change, then that has to be less than or equal to zero. So the equilibrium criteria is DG holding T and P constant is equal to zero at a minimum G, G min. So every, every, if you're, let's say, to the, there's nothing on the x-axis, okay? This is just an illustration of some general, general property. If you're not at equilibrium, but you're over here, then the Gibbs function, the, the system wants to change such that it is falling or decreasing in the Gibbs function until it gets to a minimum. If you're not at equilibrium and to the right of the equilibrium, then it wants to shift and fall until it gets to a minimum. So it looks pretty abstract, but there you go. At a fixed temperature and fixed pressure, the change in the Gibbs function is equal to zero. That's our equilibrium criterion. What was it for thermal equilibrium? Difference in temperature is equal to zero. What's it for mechanical equilibrium? Mechanical forces like pressure or force balance is equal to zero. Um, let's continue on. 
uh, the chemical potential and equilibrium. So we consider for a single phase, multi-component system, and we're really, really going to do ideal gases. But single phase, so it's just gas or liquid, but just single phase, multi-component. So in general, the Gibbs function is a function of temperature, pressure, and the amount of each component up to, let's say, J. That's a subscript they use for J number of of uh, species or components. Now there's a few steps here that I omitted. Uh, the book does a good job of describing it, where you can describe this as a sum of the coefficient or the amounts N sub I of each of those components times the derivative of G with respect to N sub I holding temperature, pressure, and all the other N's constant other than the one you're differentiating with respect to. Well, this is the chemical potential, mu. So the chemical potential is that derivative of the Gibbs function with respect to the number of moles of that species I. So you could write the chemical potential as the sum of the number of moles of component I times its chemical potential. How about the change? So the equilibrium criterion was that the chain, we needed that change in the Gibbs function holding temperature and pressure constant is equal to this mu times dNi. I'm giving you the fast Cliff Notes version, aren't I? There's more detail in the text, sorry, but. All right, so the chemical potential for an ideal gas mixture is H is the sum of Ni times H bar I. That should look familiar. And then S is equal to the sum of Ni times S bar I. Uh, I left off the subscript I right here. Such that the, when you put the H and the S together to form the Gibbs function, you have the sum of Ni times HI minus T times S bar I. Well, we have a molar Gibbs function, so it's based on a mole for that species, H minus T S bar I, and now we have the Gibbs function for an ideal gas is the sum of N times G bar I. That G bar I is emphasized is a function of the temperature of the mixture and the partial pressure of that component in the mixture, the ideal gas mixture. So this is the same, this Gibbs, um, molar Gibbs function is the same as the chemical potential. All right, keep pressing forward. So we expand out that molar Gibbs function or the chemical potential. Here it is. I changed color to emphasize that H is not multiplied by T, but H for an ideal gas is only a function of T, not T and P. And that S bar naught that naught means 1 atm pressure, so this is only a function of T, the entropy at 1 atm, or standard pressure. And then over here we find it's this last term, you have temperature and the partial pressure, which is P times Yi. So the chemical potential is a function of temperature and pressure and the mole fraction. All right, you can introduce the, the Gibbs function, molar Gibbs function at standard conditions. That would be where the pressure, it's as if uh, uh, Yi times P is 1 atm or P ref, 1 atm. All right, but pressing forward, so now you have a compact way of writing the chemical potential is a molar Gibbs function at 1 atm plus this other term. I couldn't fit it all on one page. I got to go to another page. So what you want to do is apply this now for a disassociation reaction. So in, in general, I know that the textbook takes a couple of steps before it gets to the general case. But I think everybody here has probably been exposed to some chemistry, high school as well as one college class in chemistry. And in that chemistry class, I'm sure that you dealt with disassociation reaction equation like this. In general, you talk about A and B in 
disassociating or going in reaction. I couldn't figure out how to get this arrow, so I just got this arrow like that instead of this arrow for going back and forth uh, between C and D. So this is a general equation, chemical reaction equation, where before when we did combustion, the arrow was just one way. We had reactants and then products. And in general, there was no reactants left after the combustion. Everything was in the products. And if we had any unburned hydrocarbon that was started over here, we put it in the products. We put it on both sides. But here, it's a little shift. And we have this notation like this. We're talking about you can have some A and have some B in the final equilibrium mixture, okay, as well as C and D. You don't have... A on both sides. You don't have B on both sides. You just have A on one side and, and, and B on one side. You would still call these uh, reactants. You would still call these products. And you see is if you shift the temperature and pressure, maybe you push it more to the right, the equilibrium, you get more C and more D. Or maybe you push it to the left, get more A and B in the equilibrium mixture. All right. So... Uh, this is the general case. What are these new stoichiometric coefficients multiplying the amounts? So it's like you can read this equation. Um, here's an equation. Um, let me see. CO2 goes to uh, CO plus one-half O2. Did I do that one right? What is this? This is describing the disassociation of carbon dioxide. Okay, so in that case, the nu is a 1 and a 1 and a half, those stoichiometric coefficient in front of that O2 term. Well, it takes just a little bit of algebra, and it's probably not readily obvious, but if you look at it a while, if you have a shift such that DNA goes down, so you're, that's why I put a negative sign in front of that. It's like it's there's a change in A, and it's decreasing. You divide it by the stoichiometric coefficient. That has to equal to minus DNB divided by its stoichiometric coefficient, which has to equal to the DNC divided by its stoichiometric coefficient, etc. So you could talk about some extent of the reaction, okay, as if you're going to produce more C and more D, consume more A and consume some B, and they're all related by the stoichiometric coefficients plus those negative signs. Here's another way of rewriting that instead of just one run-on sentence or one run-on equation, right, is you have four individual equations. So the extent of the reaction minus nu sub A would be how much there's a decrease in amount A. How much is, the de how much is there a decrease in amount B? C is increased and D is increased with that direction of the reaction. So now we can say, go back to this uh, equilibrium criterion, DG at constant T and P is equal to the sum of the chemical potentials times the change in the amounts of each of them. Substitute in the minus nu d epsilons, etc. Collect out the d epsilon, the extent of reaction. We find that the change in the Gibbs uh, function cri equilibrium criteria is equal to something that needs to be equal to zero. And when we look at it, the only thing you either have no reaction, doesn't make sense, or this part has to be zero, and that's the part that is set to zero. So you have an equation for the equilibrium of the reaction. So for an ideal gas mixture, uh, you substitute what is mu sub A, here it is. You substitute also for nu sub b times mu sub b, same type of form. It's that g bar naught divided by or, or plus r bar t natural log blah 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 for ideal gases. And then you rearrange, got to go to another slide, collect terms, collect all these terms minus, so this is our equilibrium equation. And we introduce the change in the Gibbs function at standard conditions as if everything was a one, a, one ATM. Just this, this is just a definition. And then you rewrite 
the equation. So you have delta G naught divided by RT is equal to, um, that needs to be an R bar, doesn't it? Sorry about that. R bar T is equal to natural log, and then they use a relationship on how to combine this natural log, natural log, natural log, such that you have a ratio of mole fractions to exponent, the stoichiometric coefficient, the ratio of P's, pressure, to reference pressure, all of that raised to a stoichiometric coefficient. And then they take this natural log of all this term and say, you know what, that's equal to the natural log of K. K is an equilibrium constant. And it's a function of temperature. It's not multiplied by temperature. It's a function of temperature. So finally, an equation after a lot of derivation that may look and hopefully does look familiar to you. Maybe you've used it before. I'm going to ask for a show of hands if this equation does look familiar to you. And if you've used an equation like this ever before, either at the high school level or at the college level, does it look familiar? So we have a constant. It depends on what reaction we're dealing with and what temperature of the reaction it is. And usually you look up that constant in the table. And then you have the equilibrium mole fractions and the raised to those stoichiometric coefficients. Then you have the actual pressure divided by P reference, all two. What's that reference pressure? 1 ATM. It's always 1 ATM, the reference pressure. You can re-express this in this form and what did they do? They said, well, the Y sub C is equal to the number of moles of C divided by the number of moles total. Do a little algebra, and you put the total number of moles under here. And you then have the total number of moles to the exponent, et cetera. This is sometimes a little more convenient for me, and I think I'll use that to solve a problem. So where do you get that equilibrium constant K? Well, you get it out of a table for the reaction of interest. So as a function of temperature, increasing temperature, usually you see that, well, first of all, what is this? This is the logarithm to base 10 of the equilibrium constant. So if I wanted to know the equilibrium constant for this reaction right here, at this temperature right here, I would take this negative 0.485, and I would have the equation K is equal to 10 to the negative 0.485. Or what they did was they took the log of the log base 10 of the K and then reported that number in their table. Notice that the numbers are large negative and then they're going up and up and up. They're getting closer to zero and then they can become positive. Uh, is there, here's a positive number right here. Some are positive. They were negative at low temperatures and then they... So what's it doing? It's shifting from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, the equilibrium. So there's more stuff on the right in equilibrium at higher temperatures. That's usually the way they write it, okay? They write it such that the K starts large negative, and then it becomes closer to zero, and then it can go over zero and become positive, and then increasing in the magnitude of the, of the coefficient. 